If there's one thing I learned about this book, it was that I had no idea that Benedict was such a ladies' man. Let's talk some memory sorrow and thorn. Hey, what's up, bookworms and Benedict lovers? Mike back again today to talk a little more Tad Williams and Memory, Sour and Thorn. Today, we're going to be dipping into book number two of that series, which is The Stone of Farewell. It's just, just Stone of Farewell. There's no V. It's just Stone of Farewell, which is just as confusing as what the actual Stone of Farewell is. But, guys, this book was released in 1990. Obviously, this is the follow-up to The Dragon Bone Chair, uh, the second book in the four-book trilogy, as I like to put it, by Tad Williams. Now, look, I really, really enjoyed The Dragon Bone Chair. So, this book is where I'm like, okay, look, the first book had unreasonable expectations due to years of poking and prodding by my older brother to read this series, and it met him. So was it able to follow that up? Well, we're going to talk about it, guys, and we're going to do that like usual, but getting into what is it about. But first, I want to let you guys know there will be no spoilers for this book, but I will be talking about some things that happen in the Dragon Bone Chair. So if you haven't read that yet, I issue a little bit of caution here. I'm not going to get into the, the details, but you're going to kind of be like, okay, well, I kind of know where these characters end up at this point. So if that is the case, guys, because I don't usually do sequels on the channel, but since this is a part of a channel relong, I am going to go ahead and review each one of the books here. I want to kind of caution you here. You know, maybe bookmark this and come back if you haven't read The Dragon Bone Chair yet. And that's a book, obviously, that I do recommend that you read. So, what is this book about? Now, it is a time of darkness, dread, and ultimate testing for the realm of Ostinard. For the wild magic and terrifying minions of the undead Sithy ruler, the Storm King, are spreading their seemingly undefeatable evil across the kingdom. With the very land blighted by the power of the Storm King's wrath, the tattered remains of the once proud human army flee in search of the last sanctuary and rallying point, the Stone of Farewell, a place shrouded in mystery and ancient sorrow. And even as Prince Joshua seeks to rally his scattered forces, Simon and the surviving members of the League of the Scroll are desperately struggling to discover the truth behind an almost forgotten legend, which will take them from the fallen citadels of humans to the secret heartland of the city, where near mortals must at last decide whether to ally with the race of men in a final war and against those of their own blood. And guys, that takes us into 1990. This is Stone of Farewell by Tad Williams. Now we're going to begin like usual, guys. We're going to talk about what makes this book good or bad. We're going to begin with the good like usual. i got to say that his character work does continue to be very good. One thing that was sold to me when I picked this series was that his character work is second to none. And I can see where people are coming from because he's developing his character so well. He's even developing some that I'm maybe not that quite interested in, but I feel like he will get me there. I trust that he's going to get me there. Some characters I'm kind of like iffy on at this point. I feel like it's nothing that he's doing wrong. Just maybe it's some focus on some characters I'm not wild about, but he has continued to do that very, very well. Characters I didn't feel like were going to, uh, you know, get developed that well based off how they were in book number one. They maybe they, maybe their character work was a little lacking in book one. I feel like he's really uh, kind of picked that up here. Roles for Megwin, for Miriam L, Kadrak. Uh, these all have greater roles in this book. Uh, hit or miss on some of those, but I cannot dare say that he's not doing a very good job on all those characters as well. So me being character first guy, obviously this is the biggest positive that I can put on this book. Uh, but uh, he doesn't forget about those greatest hits though. Simon is still very much the driving force behind this book. And I think that uh, Prince Joshua does get a lot more time to shine in this one where he was kind of almost backgroundish, I would say in book one. You got big moments with him, but for a lot of the book, he was very backgroundish. He was almost like a presence that wasn't actually on the page. You get to travel with him this time and see what is going on with him after the fall of Naglamond in book number one. So that's a, a very exciting little twist on what his party ends up doing in this story. But I got to say, Tag continues to build his world very, very well here. I mean, you get to know a lot more about the cultures of the city and, of course, the Canuck, which I am really all here for. I really like him building these cultures. And I think he's doing such a good job in that they really do feel different. A lot of times in fantasy like this, you'll get, okay, yeah, they're different. Well, how? Uh, well, they wear their hair different. Now, he really, really gets into some of the details and stuff. And you would see that they aren't quite maybe exactly all of the things that you were thinking that they were going to be based off Dragon Lord Chair. So he just really new wrinkles to some of these races. And I like the way that he's doing it. And uh, I like that he gives a lot of answers. I know they do present a lot more questions, especially pertaining to the League of the Scroll. Every time I feel like we get a new answer, uh, we get a couple more questions. Uh, we get new uh, members of this. Uh, some are really interesting. Some kind of like, 
Maybe they'll get me there in book number three. I don't know, but he does continue to uh, kind of reveal these characters, who they are. And I, I, I've started like making like a list of, okay, who are all these members in the League of the Scroll? Want to know more things there. But again, like I said, I feel like you're getting a lot of these answers. You are still kind of like, okay, well, I get this now, but now I don't get this or this. And I, mean, I think that's really just a good job of planting hooks. And it remains to be seen, obviously, if he sticks this landing. Uh, but with like a 500,000 page last book, I feel like there's going to be plenty of room for him to do that. Something else I really like about this is I feel like, as a horror guy, I feel like the, the, the horror elements are really, really cranked up this time around. There's some dark horrors that uh, Joshua and his group encounter really, really early in this. And then there's this story with this character called Scotty. Straight nightmare fuel. I mean, it is just some gruesome, gruesome stuff. And it's just... You wouldn't expect it almost in a book like this. And some of the things, some of the themes that, uh, that 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 Mr. Williams does wrestle with here, again, these are things I know that aren't going to work for everyone, but I got to bring them up. Uh, there is, basically, you think about the time period that this was written. This is before we could get into full-on grimdark and explaining things. He does describe sexual assault in a way that it kind of like leaves you there. But uh, it, it's, it's again, it's not it's not the usual, like you're expecting. This isn't like in a Malazan way, guys. It's something that was just like, oh, oh, that's, yeah, no, I didn't expect that. But uh, yeah, uh, the courage that he was displaying writing this in 1990, like I said, where this stuff was really, if ever was in a story like this, it was really implied. And I feel like it's heavily implied here. And I think he does a good job delivering that as lightly as he can. But it, it, it is here. And uh, yeah, I think that all adds to the realism of the you know, the atrocities of war, as I always put it. But, uh, you know, there's some dark stuff going on here. And it's, a lot of it is, is, is horrific. And uh, besides that, a lot of the other ele uh, horror elements I, I really, really did dig. I like that his characters continue to not feel safe. Now, this really is the influence for A Song of Ice and Fire. You can see that, obviously. He's not afraid to shank a character. I said that in the last one. And it continues this one. You lose some folks along the way. And it does suck. You know, some more than others. Uh, some that you wish would die aren't. But, you know, I don't feel like anyone's safe. And I think that's what I need to feel. I need to feel like the stakes matter in a story like this. And that's always been kind of my problem with traditional fantasy in a lot of regards is, yeah, well, the good guys are, you know, they got plot armor. They can't be killed. Uh, not the case. Not the case. They can be killed in here. And uh, anyone could die at any moment. I think that gives this story a lot of weight. And it continues to uh, really make it feel like everything that these characters are doing matters because it can go south at any time. I do like that getting a satisfying backstory. I talked about the characters earlier, but I really want to kind of just put a focus here on Benedict. At the end of the book one, you're kind of like, well, what did Benedict do to get in this hot water that he's in at the end of that book? You get it here, and I think it's a pretty satisfying resolution. It's pretty good. I really like the way that it's done, and uh, it leaves a lot of things open for what could happen down the line. But I really did like that. Of course, Benedict is obviously just about everyone's you know, favorite secondary character in the story, or side supporting character. I say he's not a secondary character. He's very much a supporting character to Simon. And uh, yeah, I, I think that his uh, his stuff that we get in this book is very, very good. And uh, I, I hope that uh, Sluda gets the, the same the same treatment eventually, because that's like my, my other favorite uh, side character is Sluda. But uh, a smaller role, I think, this time. But Iskrimner, uh, his chapters, every time they come up, they continue to be a treat. I'm always having a good time when I am with Iskrimner. Uh, some of the stuff that he does in this book are just some of my favorite chapters here. And uh, I just feel like I'm having a great time, even if it's, it's some of the stuff is kind of like, Wow, that's really an unlikable thing he's doing, but I'm still kind of laughing in like a first law kind of way of uh, the way that he's handling stuff like this. But really just, guys, this, this whole story, this book especially, just kind of feels like the calm before the storm. It feels like setting up all those chess pieces for where book three is just going to bring it all to head in a good, satisfying way, I think. The best guy, just, I just love everything that he's set up so far because uh, I, I don't know where it's going, but I feel like I like the direction that he's taking us in. I'm really all in on the journey to see where this goes now that we've kind of got this uh, side quest, I guess you would call it. And we'll talk about that. It, it kind of it, to a resolution now. And now we have all of our characters ready to unite on this one main quest. And I am totally here for it. Now, as for the bad, or like I always say, maybe the not so good. Again, these are always going to be subjective to you. Some things that maybe just didn't work for me or might not work for you. Uh, look, uh, he focuses a lot on some characters I'm not crazy about. I can never really get into the Megwin story in this. And with me, it's like, look, if he wants to develop Megwin, that's fine. I feel like in this book, he's treating her like she's a main character of the story, whereas I felt like she was almost an afterthought in book one. I don't mind giving characters increased roles. I just didn't really get into that storyline in this one. So I, I'm hoping maybe he can bring it to head in book number three. But right now, I'm just kind of like, 
ah, I feel like I would rather be spending time with other characters every time we are with Meguen. And yeah, this really does feel like the middle book of a trilogy. It almost feels like he's spending a lot of time uh, with having certain characters have to just like wait in one spot while others get to certain parts in the land. So you can't have to, you don't have to explain away how they got together at the same time. And that's fine and all, but he spends a lot of time with those characters who are just sitting still and not doing anything. And that was kind of a drag for me sometime. A big thing for me in this guy's is he splits up the groups. Now I'm fine, obviously. I don't need all my characters to stay together. Uh, the lot of cat, the cast is big here, guys. So we're gonna have to split these characters up some ways. Thing for me is I've said I love Simon, I love Iskrimner, and they're never together. I love Sludig and I love Benedict. Those are my favorite two secondary characters or supporting characters. And we do have like a split off with them, and I feel like they go on a side quest. But we, the reader, never get to see it. We don't get to visit them. And they disappear for a good 50% of this book. And that really brung me down because I do love those two characters. So I really, that was just like a, a negative by absence. I really wish that they were there more than they were. Uh, I do believe that will be the way, the rest of the way, because we did want to deal with some of uh, uh, some of the isolation moments that Simon goes through in here. And I'm fine with that. You do need those moments to kind of develop Simon. But I just, I, I wanted Sluda and, and Benedict to be around, and I felt like they really did disappear for a while. And that really, really bugged me. But uh, as for why you guys should read it, look, I think if you like book one, you're going to like this one. Uh, if book one wasn't exactly your bag, this probably isn't going to be the one to bring you in. This is very much still a slow burn story. There is lots of moments. Like, I know that some people in book one, they didn't like those moments where Simon was below the Hayholt, and it was just, like, dark, and he was just, like, suffering. And they thought that went on a little too long. It happens again in this book, guys. There's 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 a, there's a chapter like that, but it's in snow this time, you know. So uh, I, I know of all my gripes about Assassin's Quest doing the same thing. Uh, it didn't bother me as much in here because uh, with, with me, a lot of the things that people consider whiny about Simon, I consider that character growth. You got to think about where this character was just months ago and where he's at in life now. Same with Miriam L. I've heard people complain about Miriam L. Think about if you're living a life of nobility and all of a sudden you're thrust into being among the commoners. It's going to be quite a shock to you. You're not going to overnight be like, well, guess I got to grow up and just get used to it. This is the new normal. There's going to be an adjustment period, especially when these are teenagers, guys. It's going to happen. So uh, it doesn't really, really bother me that much. If they bother you, I don't know. It, it might just be uh, something that might not be for you. So there are slow moments in this book, but unlike... What I didn't like about Assassin's Quest, I'm actually invested. I want to know what these characters are struggling with internally. It's uh, it, it helps build the character for me. Whereas, you know, watch that Assassin's Quest review if you want to know what I didn't like about it. But there's just something about the world building he's doing here that just feels epic. There's something coming. Something big is coming. In like kind of like a, a Sander Lanch, Brandon Sanderson kind of way, where I've always said I feel like some of his books will have like a slow, like think of Way of Kings, had like that super slow burn. And I've always said if you just stick with it, Brandon Sanderson will reward his readers at the end. I definitely feel like that's coming here. And that, yeah, this is going to have some slowed down parts for you. But just trust. His third acts are usually pretty good. This one, not as good as Dragon Ball Chair's third act. But I still thought pretty good. And again, I like where it's leading. We've had these... All these characters either side quests now. I feel like they're all together. And where they're headed, I feel really, really positive about. So if you want a continued world and character building, this is going to be a book that works for you quite well because he's definitely doing that. You can't criticize anything he's doing there. Uh, and it still feels like, and this isn't a good way. This might feel like a negative. It's not. I feel like there's still so much to learn about this world, about Ocean Art. Because we, you, know, you can follow along on the map and see where they're traveling. There's still just tons of of areas that haven't been explored yet. Now, I know there is a sequel trilogy and spinoffs and stuff like that. He might get there eventually, but I feel like, okay, uh, I, I don't know where we're going right now, but, you know, we do have two more, one more book that's twice the size of this one. That's why I call it two books. Uh, is uh, I feel like we've got plenty of chances to go all across this map with plenty to spare. So uh, in a good way, like I said, I feel like there's still very much to learn about this world. I can't wait to get there. As for my final thoughts, guys, look, I, I did like Dragon Bone Cheer better than this one. I do think this very much, like I said, I struggled at points where it just very much feels like the middle book in a trilogy. You're sitting with characters that are just waiting around for other characters to travel. That never has worked for me. It's always been something that bugs me about epic fantasy. And uh, Simon's storyline, I think the last third of this book can really wear on your patience. It can really test if you're going to make it through this journey or not. Uh, I, I'm all in for it, but yeah, I won't lie. That did kind of bother me just a bit, but uh, Megwin's prominent role really, really brought me down, really brought this book to a crawl several times. I just don't care 
very much about what her and Aoli are doing. I'm just like, why am I spending so much time with these characters? Can I get back? I just wanted to get with other characters the whole time there. Like, I want to find out what Mary Mel's doing. I want to know what Simon's doing. I want to know where Sludig and Benedict are. I, that was a whole time when every time I was in a long, and it's, those chapters always seem to be the longest, the Megan ones. And the end goal of what they were doing in this book, I felt like it could have been summed up rather quicker. So that was something that I really struggled with. But uh, I did really appreciate the greater roles for, for Mirror Mel and Joshua. I want to know more about Kadrak. Now, look, Kadrak is a character I thought was just going to be a throwaway character in that first book. And you get lots more layers this book, and I still have tons of questions about this guy. It's like, I feel like I know what it is, but I feel like that's too easy. <laughs> you know, maybe I'm expecting uh, Tad Williams to, you know, to subvert what I'm thinking here, but maybe not. I don't know. But uh, I, I want to know a lot more. And as a character, like I said, wasn't really that interested in, but uh, I did. Yeah, this book, guys, it really did feel very much like, you know, struggling to find its feet, its footing because it was the middle book and we're kind of just getting all those board pieces set. But uh, again, I definitely think he knows where he's going with it. And uh, my anticipation for it, guys, is the same for this world as it was after Dragon Bone Chair. I'm not uh, any less excited as I was before to start Green Angel Tower. Before I go, speaking of Green Angel Tower, guys, I'm starting part one tomorrow. Now, I say part one because, here, let me grab it. Look at this, look at this big boy. Yeah, okay, now look. Here's Stone of Farewell, right? There's Green Angel Tower. It's tw over twice the size. Guys, this book, bigger than the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Okay, so it has a book one, two, three, and four in there. So we're doing books one and two in March, books three and four in April. Now, some people that are involved in the relong, they say they're going to go ahead and go all the way through. I'm afraid that would burn me out reading that much of one story. I like to bounce things around, so I'm breaking it up. And also, there's lots of other big releases coming out in March. Uh, I don't want to, <laughs> I feel like that book would take me all month to read. So uh, I have no problem splitting it up. But, you know, if you guys want to read it straight through, that's awesome. I hope that you uh, do enjoy it. And I hope you guys are enjoying the read-along on the Discord, if you haven't yet. Still plenty of time to catch up, I guess. I mean, like I said, we're going through the end of April. I think you can probably catch up because the first two books... They might be, uh, you know, decently sized for a fantasy book, but I don't think there's anything that you could knock out in one month if you want to catch up. I don't know. really just depends on you, but we would love to have you guys along. But as for this book, it's a recommend. It's just to me, it definitely felt like it was a middle book, and that isn't always bad. I just think it's something that you can kind of go back to after you finish a trilogy and say, okay, I can see what he was setting up there, and I like it more in hindsight. Now, I like the book. I just didn't love it, whereas I love the Dragon Bone Chair. So, I hope that makes sense. So, guys, Stone of Farewell, have you read it? What did you think? Drop in the comments below, and let me know. And are you going to be reading to Green Angel Tower with me? And are you going to be splitting up into two months like me, or are you going straight through like a gangster? Drop in the comments, guys, and I will talk to you there.